13. Uh, the original, it's cold out here, the original could almost be considered its own standalone film. I mean, Pam Voorhees is really the first slasher of the Friday the 13th series. It, well, she is. Uh, Jason simply superseded her as the, the next one to come in through the family. So it's a lot like Psycho, sort of, where they had the first one and then the other films, sure, they're related, but really, um, they weren't needed. Uh, on the other hand, Friday the 13th, the other films we are certainly grateful for because it brought us Jason. Um, but Betsy Palmer, Pam Voorhees, really is the first slasher of the movie. Uh, of the series. That being said, uh, let's take a look at the Friday the 13th franchise, starting with number one and two. Let's go. So, the first Friday film starts off with these like overly happy counselors. Uh, it looks more like Bible camp than anything. It absolutely makes my, my, me sick. Like, where, where's the booze, the pot, the, you know? I mean, you'd have to be overly happy on something to get into this, uh, you know, get zen into this shit. But on the other hand, this film wasted no time in getting into the sex and the kills, uh, cementing the, the formula for what these the series would become. So, uh, that's how it started. So, you know, we have a camp full of, this is about the sex scene, you have, you have a camp full of beds. May I ask why you're using the floor? I mean, after all that Bible bullshit, uh, around the campfire, I'm glad they're dead. I, I really am. I'm glad they're dead. Um, so we have Alice. She's like the heroine of the story. And then we have like Steve Christie. And I freaking hate this guy. He's like 45 years old. Like get a real job. And and that goes the same for the rest of the counselors too. Because they're like 28 years old. And don't give me this bullshit that they're 18 and whatever. There, there's no way these people are, are that young. Um, so just throw that out the window. Um, but in the first one, yeah, we have the, the whole rest of the crew. You don't really even get to know them. Uh, but we do have Kevin Bacon, um, a future star. Kind of reminds me of, like, Johnny Depp being in, in the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Uh, how he, nobody knew he'd be this big of a star. But, uh, anyway, so Kevin Bacon's in it. In it. And I gotta say, man, the, the chick he's with, not to be rude, but man, he could do a whole lot better than her. Um, that's just my opinion. The setting is, is really great, actually. You know, it's out in the woods, you know, campfires, all that. Um, but it's funny because the atmosphere can be so tranquil and then it can go eerily peaceful, uh, the dead silence of the night. And even the woods themselves can, can seem really foreboding. Uh, the point of view shots are terrific, actually, because it gives like a whodunit kind of feel. Some of you even mentioned that on the channel. And really, I'm not, it's been done in other movies before, but I think it was really perfect, perfected in the Friday uh, series um, from number one and number two. From three on out, you already knew who it was, so it kind of gets rid of that sort of feel. Um, but yeah, the whodunit, the point, the point of view shots, really well done, and uh, like, you're just wondering who's behind that, you know, obviously it's a camera, but who's behind those bushes, who's looking? Um, you had no idea that it was Jason's mom, and, and that's the thing, in retrospect, you, everything becomes clear, but at the time, if you were in theaters, this whole thing's a mystery to you, so, uh, point of view shots, really good move, uh, by the, uh, by the director, I thought it was fantastic. Okay, so, from what I understand, the camp opened in 1935, so, uh, I'm not going to try to make sense of the timeline, because frankly, it's an absolute mess. Look it up online if you like, but basically it's just assumptions, assertions, uh, kind of trying to connect the dots. It's a giant mess, like Pam Voorhees and, and her husband and who died where and when and uh, what happened in the camp. Basically, the camp opened in 1935. Jason drowned in, what, 1957. Uh, a bunch of shit went down. Uh, the camp was burnt down and now they've reopened it. So uh, the stage is set and good enough. That's, that's what we're going with. So that's how it starts off. That, so the, the, the camp had a, a really cool uh, background going into it. Like this wasn't just a camp. This, this was Camp Blood. So that's pretty awesome. You, you got to admit that's pretty awesome. 
Uh, okay, so the, the counselors get killed off, and then you end up finding out that Pam uh, Voorhees was the old cook, and, and Jason was her son, and he drowned, and she's exacting revenge, and uh, that's basically the whole motivation uh, behind the killings. By the way, trying to cook a hot dog over candles really doesn't work. Um, anyway, so I'll move on to what I wrote down here. Uh, so now let's just get to the good stuff, the kills, the sex, and all, and all that stuff. Nothing beats a Friday marathon around the campfire or a bucket with candles on it. Kevin Bacon too, I mean he makes such a quick exit, it's, it's a shame because uh, besides Betsy Palmer, like I mean Adrian King did well, but he's probably the strongest actor. But he was an unknown at the time, so, you know, whatever, what happened, happened. And, you know, I've never been a, a counselor before, but Camp Crystal Lake or Camp Blood or Forest Green or whatever you want to call it, throughout its entire history, it has to be the most sexually liberated camp ever. Like, is this what camp, camp counselors do? I've never been a camp counselor, so if you've been a camp counselor, let me know. Because I'm still 30, and all these people are, like, fucking 40. I don't care this 18 bullshit. And if that's what camp's like, I quit film. Let's, I'm going to be a camp counselor because they get laid every two seconds. It's just amazing. So, remember this one part? Like, the guy shooting the arrow? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? Who shoots an arrow that close to somebody? Like, this girl. Poor girl, too. She's hot. Uh, like, what do you think you are? Robin Hood? Why don't you just put an apple on her head and get it over with? Um, another thing, too. Jason drowned in, in 57, like I said earlier. But... From what I gather, stuff was going down in the camp before this, um, so it, it would seem to me that, I could be wrong on this, but it would seem to me that Pam was kind of twisted and sick prior to this. And I know she lost her son and all that, but talking to herself, that's exactly what happened in Psycho. He talked to his mother and blah, 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 and now she talks to her son. So I think she was always crazy. I don't think that this uh, drowning uh, was, uh, you know, what the catalyst that snapped this woman. I think she was pretty messed up to begin with. Uh, another thing I should mention is Crazy Ralph. It's got a death curse. Uh, so yeah, the, the camp's doomed and all that, whatever. I mean, um, I guess he's foreshadowing things to come, but I mean, it's a horror movie. We all know it's coming anyways. Um, but he's now deceased, so that's kind of sad. Um, I'd also like to make a shout out, somebody m mentioned uh, a game to so I'll, I'll talk about you when I get to the questionnaire, but a little shout out to, to Richard Broker, but um, like he passed away, but he, he was number three, um, and uh, he's an honorable mention. Um, uh, was he the best, uh, Jason? I'll get into that later on in, in the different, uh, or the other reviews I'll be doing, because there's like, what, 10 or 11, including Freddy vs. Jason, 12 of you included. Uh, the new one, which I won't be talking about, or maybe I will, I don't know. But uh, anyway, it's a little shout out to him, and yeah, Crazy Ralph, uh, he added uh, some things to it. Um, part two, uh, I don't know what the hell he was doing in part two, he's like, perving out, looking at these, uh, late Ginny and, 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 what is it, what's his name, Paul, uh, making out, like, I know he's probably hard up for some action, but that's kind of sick. But he gets it in the end. Uh, again, anyways, he's deceased, so, I, uh, you know, you got to give a, a shout-out to Ralph, because uh, he was a pretty cool character in, uh, in Part 1 and 2, I guess. Like, didn't play a big role, but... And, uh, just this part here. How far is it to Camp Crystal Lake? Like, why do all these counselors have such a tough time trying to find... And not just in this film, like, throughout the series. Uh, they have such a tough time finding Crystal Lake. Like, do they not have a map? Uh, why do they... Why can't they get there? Like, obviously the, the directors get there fine, and they don't inform their uh, counselors how to get there. Um, so it's it's really astounding. Uh, also, hey, this part here. So someone called PETA or PETA or whatever because the snake got demolished there. But uh, I wonder what vegans get offended at. Like, I know PETA, PETA, whatever, we get offended at, you know, hurting the snake. I wonder what vegans, what their standards are. But uh, I guess we shouldn't open that can of worms. Or maybe we should, because you know worms should be free too. So, and, and that guy there, I mean, imagine having your boner forever caught on film. I mean, I don't know if this was on purpose, but like, take a good look at it. Look at it even closer. Like, I mean, sorry for making you look at it closer, but I mean, 
That, that sucks. I don't know if that was intentional in the film. Like, you couldn't have been for the ladies, because I doubt ladies would be that impressed with some guy's half flaccid boner through, through a bathing suit. But um, uh, the cabins, though, like, it's really cool. Like, they have the, the fireplace. It seems so relaxing. It creates this atmosphere and the setting. Um, like, the movie, for the most part, doesn't really feel like a slasher at all. It's a really simple... Um, it doesn't work at all. Um, it's a really simple plot, but it's rich. It, it's rich with atmosphere and setting. It, it's a uh, great setting, great atmosphere, great everything. It's, it's just a fantastic film. This is just me battling now. Uh, I should also say the pace of the film is perfect. Like, um, they start off obviously with the kill, so it sets like the tone. Like, this is going to be a horror movie and, and who, who's behind it and all that. Uh, but it really went along at a great pace. There's, there's no parts where it drags. Uh, so they, they were really successful in, in doing that in this first film. Like, well, this film is a classic. Um, it, and when Steve dies, I mean, good. Good. I hate that guy. Like, I mean, I hate him. I hate him, I hate him, I hate him. And I wish it was a worse death because he's such a creep. Like, even touching Alice's hair, it, like, oh, man, like, it just shins, it's like bugs down your back. Like, it, it, it's so creepy. Um, and this shot here, like, this is a total ass grab on camera. I, I honestly think actors take liberties with this because they're on camera, and they just they just cop a feel. And frankly, why not? Why not go for it? I mean, what are they going to say? Hey, I'm just just part of the story, man. I gotta help her out and grab her ass, I guess. I don't know, but uh, actors have to take advantage of that. I see this in all kinds of films where they're like, uh, like in in. Uh, uh, interview with the vampire when Antonio Banderas, I don't know if you remember that, but he picks the girl up over his head. I guess he didn't have a lot of options, but he totally got an ass grab in there with a the naked chick. Um, anyways, that has nothing to do with the, my perspective on the franchise, so let's move on. And, and Alice, like, you know, when she's running away from Pam Voorhees, like, Pam Voorhees shows up, and at that point, you know, okay, who else could it be besides Pam? So you already know this, and they don't waste too much time uh, solidifying the fact that yeah she's the one killing everybody so but before that Alice is all scared and uh, you know she's running around and, and you know good call on the rope Alice but unfortunately the door opens the other way so that rope really isn't useful to you at all uh, barricading the door made sense um, but yeah so Pam she's talking to Alice she totally goes fruit loops and she starts talking um, you know to Jason and, and, and stuff in her own mind and uh, it's just, a, it's a little bit, it's a little bit crazy, but again, that's what I was talking about with the, with the psycho thing. Um, but, so, yeah, so Pam, Pam's like this crazy and seeking revenge over Jason's death. Can you imagine if Jason was killed by a drunk driver and she joined, like, Mothers Against Drunk Driving? What would she do? Like, imagine how many sequels that would fill. Like, that's a really sad note. I shouldn't really be mentioning that, but, man, that would be, that would be epic. Um... Anyways, let's move on from that. That's a little bit too serious of a topic for a Friday film. Okay, so now now comes part two. And uh, so we got part two here, and it's, it's still kind of a whodunit. And actually, to a certain extent, Ralph uh, might be, you might even think, if you hadn't seen this uh, before, like let's say it was 1980, when did this come out, 1981 or 82? If you'd never seen it before, you actually might think that Ralph's picking up the slack. Like, I mean, um, he was kind of creepy in part one, he's creepy in number two, so it's certainly feasible that he could have been behind it, but of course, everybody knew Jason was the culprit. culprit. And then, of course, that's cemented as who it is when she, when Ginny calls his name at the end, uh, wearing the hood and all that stuff. Uh, so, you know, did Alice, uh, did she make the, all that up at the end? Was that imagined? Uh, you know, Jason would have had to grow up awfully fast. So my take on it is, yeah, she did imagine it, and Jason was already uh, grown up, uh, looking through you know woods or whatever, and he saw this, and now he's exacting revenge. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of uh, that would make sense. I mean, in the, in the new release, the 2009 release, um, he is a child, and as to what's actually wrong with Jason, uh, I know this isn't a nice word to use, but I guess he's like a mongoloid. And uh, with the power to regenerate or something. I mean, the we don't know too much about Jason, which is something that is 
better than what they did in part six with Halloween, where they released way too much information on why uh, Michael can do what he can do. Um, Jason, you never really hear about that, except for like Jason X, which we'll get to that, but you know, he can regenerate. Well, well, duh, I mean, we knew that part. Um, so now, number two, number one kind of sets the tone with, you know, the sex and the kills and the stereotypes or whatever. But number two just absolutely, absolutely cements this for sure, that this is the formula. It's basically, uh, I wrote down the formula, can't, sex, booze, dead. That's the formula. Uh, so they just ran with it in the series after that. Um, except for part six, you don't like people have sex, but I'll get to that. You don't actually, it sucks, you don't get to see any boobs or anything like that. Uh, unless you're a girl, maybe you don't care. Or maybe you do. And you're my type of girl. Okay, so uh, continuing on with number two, um, Alice starts off in a dream and kind of recaps the fight uh, between her and Betsy uh, Palmer, uh, Pam Voorhees. I didn't like that part. It, it just, it was like we know what happened. And I get that she's traumatized by it, but uh, it didn't have to go on that long. Um, I know they wanted Adrian King back in, in, uh, in the, the Friday series. She opted out of it. She agreed to do that part of the role. And it's unfortunate because she had a stalker, and and, and then um, I forget the whole story, but it really freaked her out, and all of a sudden she had this maniac going after her. She's a really pretty girl, and and she did a great job. So it's, it's a shame that, that that had to happen to her, and it kind of sucks because she would have been like the Nancy Thompson, uh, you know, from from Nightmare uh, for the for the Friday series. So. Uh, Essentially, Tommy Jarvis, in my mind, kind of takes over that role, but that doesn't happen until number four. Um, as well, the pre credit sequence goes on for like 15 minutes. It's, I don't know if it sets the record for longest pre credit sequence in a film, but it goes on for like 15 minutes. You'd have to do some research to figure out if it, if it actually is the longest, but it, it's, it's definitely got to be up there. It goes on way too long. Um, and again, uh, they, they wipe out Alice. Disappointing. Uh, reminds me of Nightmare 4, where they wipe out, you know, Kincaid and Joey and, uh, uh, again, fuck it, Kristen, uh, at the beginning of the, not the beginning, but not too far into the film. So, you know, you're rooting for, for Alice the whole way, and then they just nix her off. But that was for her personal life reasons, and had nothing to do with the story, really, at all. You never know. And, okay, the, these candles are seriously not working out. Um, this is supposed to be a prop, but anyway. Um, so, again, they show up in this town, um, the counselors, right? And they actually have to go and place a phone call. Like, why Why doesn't it... This is almost like my rant about the Nightmare series when nobody knew about Freddy. Why doesn't none of these... Why do none of these counselors know where the actual camp is? It blows my mind. Like, I know they didn't have GPS or whatever, but... You know, you do have a map, don't you? Like, didn't you phone ahead? Didn't, like, when you applied for the job, um, didn't you know where it is? Or do you just aimlessly apply? Like, they didn't even have internet. So, you, yeah, that's true, too. They didn't even have internet. So, to apply for this job, you'd either have to know somebody who knew where the camp was, or you'd have to mail, like, a letter or something, I'd imagine. Well, I just, you know, I don't get it. And then there's Ted. Ted's a complete dork, but I, I like Ted. I, I can't believe you made that a part, too. Uh, but he does this tow truck prank. This is quite an elaborate prank because you have to rely on them. First of all, what tow truck driver would do this? But um, you have to rely on them actually chasing this truck all the way down the street to meet you. Like, how could you possibly predict that they're doing that? So really, you're just a dick because if they didn't bother chasing after the truck, they'd just be shit out of luck. Not downtown. That essentially would be downtown. But they'd be in this town without a truck and they wouldn't know, so I guess you'd have to drive back to them or whatever. So it's just a real prick thing to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, and there's a, there's a town. like right there. Wouldn't the town know where Camp Blood was? Why would you have to place a phone call? Why wouldn't you just walk into the store and be like, hey, we're going to Camp Crystal Lake? And they'd be like, oh yeah, line it's line four, you, you turn right, and it's the second. They would know this stuff. I go camping, uh, or we go to cottage once a year. And um, I've actually, it's really hard, there's no signs or anything like that. I've directed people in from, I live in Toronto, I've directed people in uh, to this place that's like two and a half hours northeast. No problem. 
So there's no, and, and if you knew what I was talking about, this area, it's like insane, you know, turn left at a rock, there's a dead porcupine, make a right, jump over the river, two rocks to the left, like it's crazy. Um, so if I can guide people in, they've got to be able to guide people in too. And I, it's not like I was using cell phones, I just, you know, phoned my friend. And, anyways, I don't want to go on too long about, about this, but the, the mystery of where this place is to these counselors, like, I mean, it's your place of employment, you should know where you're going. Uh, and driving up to this thing, look at this. <laughs> what the heck is that? Where did this sucker come from? I don't know. <laughs> Let's move it. Really? You don't know what that is? Like, what the heck could that be? How close do you have to be to identify a branch or a, or a log on the road? Um, yeah, what a mystery. What could that be? It's fucking... Anyway. Um, now, this the camp is on the same lake. It's, you know, Crystal Lake or whatever. And, uh... Man, this sucks. Um, it's on Crystal Lake. It's not the same camp, so the, the scenery does get changed around a little bit. And this kind of like fixes some problems for me in the later films, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but why would Jason really bother going after them? Is it is he angry at like every teenage camp counselor? Um, he doesn't discriminate. You don't have to be a counselor. I mean, he killed the cop. He killed Crazy Ralph. But then he goes beyond his camp. So I guess it's like the whole territory kind of thing. Jason's just pissed in general. Um, I'd be pissed too, you know, somebody, you know, you better watch my comment there. I'd be a little bit pissed too, you know, somebody let me drown and they're having sex and drinking booze and I'm sitting there, I'm like this ugly little mongoloid kid. Um, but you know, if Jason didn't, if Jason can't die, why the hell didn't he just walk out of the lake? So I, I don't get, there's something that must have happened in there, but that's what I love about it, that they don't bother explaining, you know, how Jason made it out of the lake how he grew up to be this, you know, what he became. Uh, Terry, uh, damn. I mean, she is the sexiest friggin' girl. Uh, I, like, I'm just so in love with her. There's another girl that I'm actually more in love with in, in the Friday series. I'll get to that later on, uh, and I'll gush over her. But I mean, damn, like, look, look at those piercing eyes, and, you know, I don't know if this is against community guidelines, but I'll risk it. Look at that ass. It's like, it's like scientists around the world got together and like genetically figured out how to create the perfect ass on a woman. Um, the campfire story uh, kind of sets the tone for the entire series. Uh, it explains everything in the background. Well, let's check it out. Legend has it that Jason saw his mother beheaded that night. And he took his revenge. A revenge that he'll continue to seek if anyone ever enters his wilderness again. And by now, I guess you all know, we're the first to return here. Five years, five long years, he's been dormant. And he's hungry. So it's explaining the background. Obviously, Paul there is trying to, like, play it down or whatever, like, you know, now that we've gotten this out of the way, but it sets the legend, you know, up. And, uh, and it creates like this mystique about the movie before anything even starts. And uh, for me, that was like, it really drew me in. It really, it really did. Uh, because, uh, hey, I burped it. Hey, so it is working. Then there's Mark. Poor Mark, eh? Um, you know, he can't run with everybody and whatever. He's got a disability, but he, he manages just fine. And, uh, and then he's about to get with this like really good looking girl or whatever. Uh, I call her Perfume Crotch, um, but that's another story. Um, and then, so unfortunately, he just gets hacked down by Jason, and, and the guy never, you know, gets to be with him. And that was, that would have been a really interesting sex scene, though. Like, how would they have worked that? That would have been the most interesting sex scene, probably, in the series. They should have ran with that, and then Nick Smart. At least let the guy get some. Like, I mean, you, you make him handicapped for the movie, and then you don't even let him get, he didn't, he didn't even have sex. So that he, they, they broke the rule. He didn't have sex yet. At least give him, at least give him the sex. Give him the sex, you know. Jason's uh, stealth and booby traps. Um, it's too bad they got away from that because, like, that was kind of like his thing, right? He was surviving in the forest, 
And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't ever recall seeing Jason eat at all. But I, I guess at this point, before he turned into a zombie, he ate. I'm presuming. Um, so uh, the stealth thing they got away from, and as well the booby traps uh, were pretty cool. Um, like there's only really one booby trap. You know when Scott gets, uh, you know, looped up in, the, in, in that. Uh, what is that? Snag? Is that what you call it? Um, and then, um, and of course, sneaking up on Ralph would be the stealth part. And there's other parts too where you see a shadow, which could be Ralph, could be whatever. Um, and then, uh, what else? Uh, Ginny talking about uh, Jason's lore. Some of you brought this up on the channel. Um, that was probably one of the favorite, my favorite parts of the movie. Her talking about, um, you know, it's basically her theorizing, uh, and it turns out correctly. Uh, about Jason being out there and uh, what he would have to do to survive and, and the fact that he would be seeking his mother's revenge and all that. And it all turned out to be true. So she's she's really good at, I don't know, put, putting the pieces to a hypothetical puzzle together, which is pretty cool. Um, Jason's hood, uh, you know, uh, this isn't masked Jason with the, with the well, it is masked Jason, but not with the hockey mask. Um, yes, it is a striking... Uh, resemblance to uh, the mask that was worn by uh, the, the, the killer in uh, the town of Dread Sundown, uh, the 1976 film. I believe they're coming out with a remake as well, uh, which is probably one of the movies that would really benefit from a remake, but I don't want to talk about that. Um, so that's all I really have to say about, about Ginny uh, in terms of her, her talking. Uh, but the lore is set, and then it changes uh, as we go on. But I'll, I'll, again, I'll get into that when I start talking about like you know five, six, seven, and eight, and, all, and how crazy it gets after that. So to conclude my thoughts on, on parts one and two, uh, part one is obviously a classic. It could stand alone uh, by itself. If there was never any other Friday movies made, uh, people would still remember this film. Uh, uh, is it a, is it Gone with the Wind? Is it whatever you want to? Put up there as a Citizen Kane, of course not. But as far as slashers go in, in that genre of movies, it's like uh, it's the golden cap. It, it's just in not the religious sense, but uh, it, it's just amazing. Um, uh, number two, uh, probably one of the best follow-ups I, I think I've seen. Uh, it, it picked up and brought in a whole new character. It's a very unique thing where they had the villain being one person, and then uh, in the first uh, movie being Pam Voorhees. And then the villain in, in the second one uh, being her son. Um, that's the, the, the most similar thing I can think of that is, that had something to do with that sort of storyline uh, was um, uh, you know Scream, where they kind of mixed characters that related with each other. So I hope you enjoyed my uh, first overview of uh, the Friday the 13th series and putting up with me eating a hot dog the whole way. You know, I'm out camping, man. I got. Gotta get my, my gut full. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for your questions. And uh, Friday the 13th rules. So we'll see you for episode two or part two or whatever the hell I'm calling it. Take care. Bye.